do that. I'll start that over. Uh, so thanks again, Gilda. So um, as uh, uh, folks may know, my name is uh, Jason. I am a child psychologist, uh, and I, uh, my education was at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, I got my PhD there, um, working really in uh, community-based child settings, school-based settings. I uh, did a lot of my work in uh, the Cabrini Green housing projects that existed back then, Lathrop Home um, housing projects. I then went off to University of Washington School of Medicine and was in Seattle uh, for a year for my clinical internship, working in both community as well as um, uh, correctional settings for kids. Uh, and then after that, did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan Medical School uh, for uh, a couple years, focusing on um, uh, suicide and depression in kids, uh, focusing on uh, uh, prevention programs. Uh, and since then, I've been at Northwestern University. I've been there for, uh, gosh, uh, uh, 16 years or so, um, and uh, been doing a variety of different things there, focusing on juvenile justice uh, work, um, again, focusing on um, uh, uh, suicide and, uh, more recently, non-suicidal self-injury, which we're going to cover today. Um, about uh, 12 years ago, I started working at um, what is now called Amita Health, which is uh, previously called Lexian Brothers Behavioral Health Hospital. I continue to work with them as a, a consultant, um, uh, but most of my time these days is spent uh, running a PhD program in clinical psychology, um, as well as working as a um, psychologist and researcher at the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital. Um, so that's all the stuff. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> sure. So thanks everybody for taking your time today uh, to come in. Uh, it's freezing out there, uh, although it seems like it's gotten a little bit better than this morning. This morning was pretty brutal. Um, so I, I really appreciate everybody coming in to, uh, uh, to talk with uh, us about this topic. Um, we're going to focus today on depression. Uh, we've got about an hour. I probably have more slides than we can get through in an hour. And uh, the slides are there. They're no big deal. Uh, what's more important is you all getting your uh, questions answered, that uh, you walk away with this with more information than you came in with. Um, and so in that way, I really want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, ask your questions. Uh, throw out the uh, examples that you want to give me. Please don't use any names, though. We don't, uh, especially because this is being recorded, please don't say anybody's name. But you're welcome to give some examples, some questions that you might have, uh, and I will try to answer them in the best way possible. Does that sound good? All right, so let's do make this entertaining and, and interesting, even though the topic really isn't all that uh, entertaining. What's that? This is in the way. Okay, we will go ahead and move this then. Um, how is that? All right, we'll do that. I want to make sure you can see. Um, so again, what we're going to talk about today is uh, depression among adolescents. So uh, when we're thinking about uh, depression, you know, it says here beyond the blues. A lot of times we're thinking about uh, what's the difference between when a teen is just experiencing their normal uh, mood states. We all know uh, that teens go through experiences of being happy and grouchy. Uh, typically within a minute, uh, they will go between being happy and grouchy. Um, so we see that there's, you know, can be mood fluctuations in kids. The truth is there's actually mood fluctuations in adults too. We can go from feeling perfectly happy one moment to being a little bit ir irritable and grouchy in the next moment. What we're going to talk about here though is beyond just uh, those experiences, those normative and fluctuations and experiences of mood that, that we all experience, it, and teens tend to experience more uh, than your average kid. Uh, what we're going to talk about is actually depression. And so when we think of uh, depression, um, one of the things that we want to focus on is what we refer to as depression that requires treatment. Sometimes people refer to this as clinically significant depression or clinical depression. Um, again, there's going to be fluctuations in kids' mood. Uh, there are going to be experiences that kids face that are challenging for them, and those kids can use help to get through those. But they're not going to be experiencing depression to the point where it starts to impact their daily life. That's what we're talking about when you hear the term clinical depression or clinically significant depression. And when we look at that, that is not a common occurrence, although it is also not a rare occurrence either. So not every kid and not every teen, even though they can be grumpy and irritable and grouchy at times, not every kid is going to have uh, depression. 
When we're talking about depression, we're talking about uh, 8% of adolescents experiencing depression um, at any given time. Um, and we've seen over uh, the age groups that depression actually increases a little bit as kids age. So children, about only 2% of children will be experiencing uh, depression, whereas adolescents, it's a much higher rate. And you can see how that rate increases over time. What else do you see with it? It might be hard to see uh, probably in the back there. But you've got your um, uh, traditional uh, blue for boys, but we tried to mix it up a little bit and did red for girls here. What you're seeing is um, uh, that the uh, major depressive episodes, uh, you actually see a gender differentiation. Oh, and I think, yeah, those are reversed. I apologize. Um, I reversed them even more, but then messed up the, uh, uh, messed up the title. Uh, the blue is actually girls. I was trying to go against the stereotype. Um, and then I messed myself up in my title. Uh, I forgot. I went back to the stereotype in making the title. So what you're seeing there is that you see a gender differentiation in depression that happens around puberty. So usually what happens is rates between males and females, boys and girls, are about the same uh, for depression when they are kids. But when they hit puberty, you see rates among girls increase much more than for, for boys, sometimes almost to the point of two to one, uh, depending on the age group. So girls will be more susceptible in their teen years to depression than you're going to see um, uh, for boys. Uh, but what you also see here is that a significant amount of boys do over time experience depression. And these rates are of cumulative uh, depression, so over time, how many kids experience depression at least once in their life. And as you can see here, those rates can get up to about a third of adolescents. So even though we have to be careful to not assume that every adolescent is going to get depressed, there's also a fairly high likelihood, uh, about a third, again, of our teens are going to experience a period where they would meet criteria for a major depressive episode. And I'm going to explain what that is in a little bit. So again, it is a fairly high number. So it's not rare. It's not everybody, though. Okay. So it is something that we need to pay attention to, something we need to look out for, again, beyond just that normative experience of sadness uh, that kids experience. Uh, there's been a question of, are things getting worse for our teens? Um, I think there's always this experience that uh, you know, when you're, when you're parenting a teen, that it's the worst it's ever been, right? When, when you're looking at um, uh, uh, the world as it is right now. But there is actually some evidence to suggest that we've seen an increase in rates of depression among teens. And so this was a, a study done uh, by an insurance company, Blue Cross Blue Shield, just looking at rates of depression within their populations of insured individuals. So you have to take that with a grain of salt because it's not necessarily representative of, of kids outside of those commercial insurances. But Blue Cross Blue Shield, this is a national representative uh, sample for their, um, uh, their insurers uh, or, or insurees. Uh, so in that sense, it says something even though it might not be fully accurate in terms of everybody in the country. And what they saw was a pretty significant increase uh, in rates of depression um, and looking at particularly the 12 to 17 year olds, a 63% increase in rates of depression for that group. Um, and that's just uh, uh, diagnosed at one time. It's not that cumulative diagnosis, right? The cumulative diagnosis is, have you ever been diagnosed? This is just looking at, of their entire population, who got a diagnosis. And they did see a pretty significant increase uh, comparatively to the other age groups. Everybody increased, by the way, uh, over this three-year period. But adolescents saw the greatest increase, a pretty dramatic increase in rates of depression. So there's some evidence that it's getting worse. Um, whether or not that's a trend that continues, whether that's a blip, we don't know. Uh, there are some things that increase uh, risk for depression. So a lot of the things that um, have uh, been going on over this, this uh, time period and such. You know, so we see economic instability. Um, certainly recession influences this. Um, we also uh, have seen the rise of social media over the last 10, 15 years, uh, which there's a lot of debate about how helpful versus hurtful that is. So there's a lot of things that are going on with our teens issue, these, uh, these days that may be influencing their susceptibility or vulnerability to depression. But do we know for sure? No, we don't. So there's nothing we can pin and, and say for sure that is why 
uh, kids are more likely to be depressed these days than even just a couple years ago. Uh, and it, like I said, we don't know whether this is even representative of everybody, and we don't know whether this is just a blip and it evens out over time. Uh, we're going to have to keep watching it. So what do we mean when we talk about depression? So when we're thinking about depression, uh, from a clinical perspective, we're talking about, as it says up here, a major depressive disorder. And these are the criteria that make up a major depressive disorder. So the first obvious one here that's really required for a major depressive episode is a depressed mood. Right? So the kid has to experience a sense of sadness, uh, being down, um, uh, and experiencing uh, a, a difference from how they are normally feeling. Right? So that is a, a really important key aspect to having a major depressive episode, as you would expect. Now, in kids and teens, that can appear a little bit differently. That can present actually as irritability, more so than just being down. Uh, in fact, kids are more likely to experience irritability than adults when they're experiencing depression. Uh, so you might think, oh, they're just being grouchy, and they might just be grouchy but they also may be experiencing something that's beyond that. Now, how do we know that? Well, if the irritability is also associated with some of these other symptoms, that's when we start to become concerned. So what, are we, are, what else are we looking for? Um, anhedonia uh, is the technical term that you might hear, but in reality what that is is a loss of pleasure or interest in things that used to bring me pleasure or interest. So things that the kids, uh, your, your kid used to do, they no longer like to do. And I'm not talking developmentally. You know, you used to love to play with Legos. Now you're not playing with Legos. Mom, I'm 16, right? You know, and meanwhile, when you're not looking, he's playing with his Legos. Um, but uh, I'm not talking developmentally things that change over time. I'm talking things that they used to enjoy doing like a month ago and that other kids his age or her age enjoy doing, no longer interested in doing. And again, not switching to something else. Kids do that all the time. Teens do that all the time. They just start to lose interest in most of the things that, that had brought them interest before. So in order to have a major depressive episode, you have to have either that depressed move or that adhedonia, that loss of interest or pleasure in things that used to bring interest or pleasure. Does that make sense? So those are going to be your two kind of key aspects to a major depressive uh, disorder. You have to have one or the other, or you could have both, okay? But that's not enough in and of itself. You also have to have a handful of some of these other symptoms. So uh, four or more of these other symptoms, such as weight or appetite change, uh, change in sleep, agitation, uh, so a physical agitation, or uh, what we call a motor retardation, that is when you're really just kind of moving slow, right? And I'm not talking about your kid who always moves slow. We have some kids who are always kind of fast and some kids who are always kind of slow. This is a change from how they usually are, okay? Uh, fatigue, loss of energy, feeling worthless, um, uh, having excessive or inappropriate guilt. You know, everything is my fault, Every, everything is my responsibility. Um, trouble concentrating, thinking, making decisions, uh, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Those are going to be your key symptoms that you're going to be looking for. Now again, teens aren't going to have all of these, but we need to have out of all of these here, including these two that they must have at least one or the other, they have to have five of these symptoms um, in the last two weeks to qualify. Okay? And it has to be about every day. So if they had it once, one day they had a horrible day and they had maybe five of these things. They woke up irritable, grouchy, just the world stinks. Um, they're feeling all this guilt, they're tired, they have no energy, they didn't, you know, they didn't sleep well the night before. I hope you're sitting there and you're going, oh my goodness, they have, they have five or more of these symptoms. And then tomorrow they're back to normal? That's not major depression, that's just a bad day, okay? So what we're looking at is kind of a persistent pattern of behavior nearly every day, if not every day, for two weeks or more, okay? That's generally what you're going to be looking for. Uh, now, in, in youth, again, as I mentioned with the irritability, you're going to see some things that are a little bit different. So as it says up here, with the depressed mood, you might be able to identify that 
um, through crying spells, seeing them tearful a lot, crying. Um, the, again, the irritability, uh, crankiness. Uh, they also might be easily frustrated, emotionally reactive. You ask them something, they're like, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it, right? They don't want to engage with you. And again, if they're like that all the time, <laughs> that's just a kid who's kind of irritable and cranky all the time. That's different, right? What we're talking about here is a change from baseline, change from how they normally are. And again, that anhedonia, that loss of pleasure or interest, so they don't want to hang out with family as much as they used to. And again, that's not that developmentally normal change that kids go through, that teens go through. Literally, we're talking about, you know, two months ago, they were hanging out with their friends in the lot. Now they're isolating. Now they don't want to hang out. Uh, they used to come and at least talk to you a little bit. Now they're just going right to their room, not wanting to talk at all. Okay? Now again, there could be lots of explanations for that. Maybe they have a new love interest and they're spending all their time focusing on that love interest and they're ignoring their friends and they're ignoring you. So you have to be careful that you're not over-interpreting some of this. Okay? Um, but generally you're going to see that loss of interest or they start getting into more fights with friends, more fights uh, with you. Um, they start to disengage from school, extracurricular activities. Um, uh, when they stop doing video games, that's a huge concern, right? Um, so they're like, I'm no longer interested in video games. You know something's going on there. Um, any other activities that they used to enjoy, sports, things like that, excessively complaining about being bored, okay? Now, again, a lot of this stuff kids will do normal, normatively. This can be very, many of these things in isolation, that's not a big deal. We're talking about when they are combined with all of those other things that we're seeing there. So again, with weight or appetite change, one of the things that you do have to be careful about with kids is that they might not be gaining weight, right, uh, as they are expected to. They might not be losing weight, as you might expect with adults who maybe lose their appetite and, and start to lose weight, uh, but they might not be gaining as, as expected. So you do have to look for that as well. Um, or it can be the other side. They do a lot of emotional eating. So they're eating a lot more than they normally eat. Um, a big one you see with kids are these, what we call in the um, clinical world, somatic complaints. This just means physical complaints. My stomach hurts a lot. I have headaches a lot. Um, and there's no migraine. There's, no, there's nothing else that might explain what might be going on for, for that teen. Right? So what they do what we call somaticize, where a lot of the emotional stuff starts to, to really interact with uh, their gut, starts to interact with their head and they start to experience real feelings inside of their body um, of pain in terms of uh, a pain in their head, discomfort in their, in their abdomen. Um, they start to uh, uh, get more upset stomachs, uh, might even have uh, larger GI issues. That can be emotionally linked. It also could be something else that has nothing to do with that, but when we start to see that along with these other things, and we tend to see that more with kids than we do with adults, uh, that is something we need to pay attention to. So these sleeping changes, staying up um, uh, very late at night, uh, doing a lot of what we call, um, uh, I, what I tend to call screen avoidance. They're avoiding a whole lot of things by burying themselves into screens. So unlike the anhedonia where they stop having interest in video games or whatever, they just bury themselves either into social media or video games, into TV, um, as a way to just avoid everything else in the world. If I can just be constantly getting all of this information from screens, I don't have to think about the pain I'm experiencing right now. Um, so they might be doing that and that might be really getting in the way of their sleep. They also might not be able to sleep, which is why they're doing those things. So you have to differentiate those two. Um, sometimes they are refusing to wake up for school. Now that might be common, right? So we're not talking about when they're doing that normatively. It's when that's ch changed from normal mixed with all these other symptoms. Uh, agitation or, or uh, motor retardation, you're gonna see from the agitation side a lot of pacing, wringing their hands, a lot more of their shaking of their legs or tapping their foot than they've done in the past. Um, difficult sitting still. On the motor retardation side, their thinking might slow down, their speaking might slow down, their walking or body movements might slow down. So you're gonna see a change one way or the other, uh, depending on the experience that that uh, uh, kid is having uh, with depression. It might elevate them and get them really agitated. It might slow them down, okay? From fatigue, again, that constant complaining about being bored, uh, but also falling asleep in class. Uh, falling asleep as soon as they get home, they go right to bed. Um, complaining about not having enough energy, trying to get out of physical education 
uh, classes because they just don't have enough energy to do it. Uh, so that can be uh, a good indicator of when fatigue or loss of energy is, is going on for a particular uh, uh, teen. Uh, with feeling worthless, excessive inappropriate guilt, uh, so being really sensitive to rejection or failure. And again, that's not uncommon for a lot of teens, uh, particularly as they kind of figure out themselves and figure out their social environment. But we're really talking about an excessive amount of this, something that's atypical for them. Uh, needing excessive reassurance, uh, needing us to say you're okay, everything's going to be all right, over and over and over again. Uh, by the way, a little side note, what does reassurance typically do to people who are seeking it? Does it increase it or decrease it? Actually increases it, yeah. So the more I seek reassurance from you and the more you give it to me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to seek more of that. I'm going to keep asking for more of it, right? Because I'm relying on you to make me feel okay, okay? So when I don't feel okay now and you make me feel better momentarily, I'm going to keep seeking that out. Okay, so it actually increases things. It's a natural thing for us to do, to reassure our children. And it actually ends up, in, in normal circumstances, it's just fine. But in these circumstances, it can make things much, much worse. Okay? Um, blaming self for everything. Everything is their fault, right? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's my fault this happened to you. It's my fault this happened at school. You know, it's my fault that, uh, um, you know, the economy is doing so well, or whatever it might be. Everything is my fault, right? Um, and so everything is, is, is related to me, and it comes in some way from that teen sense that I am the center of the universe, right? Teens have that thing where, like, everybody's watching me, everybody's paying attention to me, you know, I'm kind of the center of everything um, for good and for bad, right? So it all can, and it can get very confusing for them, and so they might end up blaming themselves for a lot of things that you find very confusing. And you're saying, well, why, why are you feeling like that's your responsibility? That's not your responsibility. They still feel it's their responsibility, that it's their fault. Uh, they also might express some significant uh, anger towards themselves. Uh, even what we refer to as self-hatred, uh, where they see themselves as disgusting or despicable or horrible that no one would ever like them. Okay? And this is beyond just kind of a general low self-esteem. Uh, this is more of a hatred of oneself. In terms of these other last couple of symptoms here, so difficulty concentrating, thinking, making decision. So you might see a slowing down of their thinking. They're having a hard time weighing different factors to make a decision. Um, they're also experiencing inattention when they've never had inattention before, easily distracted when they were never distracted before. So we're not talking about kids who ha already have a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We're talking about kids who have previously not had trouble making decisions, previously not had trouble with distraction or inattention. And then finally, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Some kids might engage in uh, what we call non-suicidal self-injury, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, they might have a really pessimistic view of, of the future, might think, why bother? None of it's worth it anyways. Uh, this overall sense of hopelessness, doom and gloom. Uh, you also might see a preoccupation with depressive, suicidal, or dark kind of art or literature, things like that, um, even violent things that they, they might get focused on. Uh, and again, by itself, those things, not necessarily a problem. Some of these things are a problem by themselves. So kids engaging in non-suicidal self-injury, regardless of major depressive disorder, is a concern. Um, you know, kids who really get into, uh, you know, goth or, or emo type stuff and start to get into uh, uh, subcultural media and things like that, in and of itself, not necessarily a problem, can sometimes lead them to certain influences but in and of itself, not necessarily a concern um, uh, as long as all these other things are not there. So again, you're hearing me say that multiple times, right? Any one of these things your kid is guaranteed to do, right? If you look at all of the symptoms all together, at some point or time, um, they're going to experience uh, these kind of things. They're going to do some of these things. That's okay. That's normative. What we have to be careful about is when we see all of these things kind of coming together at one time, uh, particularly when it lasts more than two weeks, and we see it happening uh, multiple times uh, throughout those two weeks. Make sense? Okay, so that's our general overview. Um, when we look at major depression, one of the reasons that we are here talking about this is that, number, number one, we saw the prevalence. 
you know, a large number of kids will experience major depressive disorder at least once uh, before they're 18. Um, and about 8% of, of, of our uh, teens experience depression at any given time. So it does impact a large number of kids. Um, but we also know that the earlier that one experiences major depressive uh, disorder, the more likely they are to then have major depressive disorder going into the future. And so there's some, some data up here that show when children have it, uh, so before the ages of about 13, they are much more likely, they double their risk of then continuing to have that into adolescence or experiencing it again in, into adolescence. And then we know that um, major depressive disorder before the age of 20 doubles or triples risk into adulthood. So one of the key points of this is to point out that we need to intervene early. We need to address this with our youth when they're experiencing this. We don't want to ignore it. We don't want to hope that it's going to get better and then three months later it's not better. Right? We want to address it so that it doesn't escalate. Uh, we want to address it so that we can reduce some of this risk of um, depression as our kids uh, age into adulthood. All right, so that's really the key takeaway for this. It's also associated with a whole bunch of other uh, things as kids go into later teenage years and into adulthood. Um, so alcohol, drug use, anxiety disorders, um, worse overall functioning in terms of work and relationships into adulthood. And we also know it's associated with significant um, uh, physical health problems as well. So this is just showing uh, what depression can be associated with in terms of other medical conditions. And as you can see here, about 30% uh, will have anywhere between four or more conditions in addition to their major depression in adulthood. Um, so it does increase risk for other physical medical problems as kids age into adulthood. So again, prevention of this is very important. Intervention when it happens is very important because we want to help to forestall and prevent all of the other associated problems with depression. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so there are some other depressive disorders that um, uh, I'm going to briefly uh, update you on. But before I do that, I want to stop. I've been talking for a while now. Um, and some of this stuff is a little heavy. So I want to stop, see if there's any thoughts, any questions. Um, also make sure not too many people have uh, fallen asleep, because when I lecture for a while, sometimes that can happen. Any questions or thoughts or comments? Yes? Yes. Yes, diabetes, heart issues, a um, uh, whole bunch of different things, right? And these, these are just, you know, they just did a simple count of conditions that people experience. Um, and we do see that major depressive disorder is associated with a whole bunch of these other things. Now, there's a chicken versus egg question there. Uh, does somebody who has a lot of health issues have an increased risk of depression? Yes, right? Does somebody who has depression also then have an increased risk for some of these other, uh, other health issues? Yes. So it really goes both ways. For uh, one individual person, there might be a different ordering of that, right? The depression might have happened first, and then some of the health conditions might have come as a result of that. You know, so for instance, when uh, stress, we know, has a major impact, uh, cortisol levels and, and such, um, can impact a lot of different things uh, with inside of our bodies. And uh, depression can lead to increased stress. That can then lead to increased health issues. And then vice versa. Health issues can lead to depression. Um, so what exactly is a pathway for that, uh, I think, is, is uh, highly variable depending on the individual. Yes? It's a great question. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So what are some of the antecedents or what leads people, what contributes to the development of depression? Um, I actually had a slide on that that I took out because I knew I wouldn't have enough time, so I had to pull some slides out. Um, uh, so you're welcome to contact me and I can send you some more information on that, but it is a whole host of things. Uh, you asked, is it, is it hereditary? So we do know that there's a definite genetic contribution to, to depression. That said, People who are vulnerable to depression because maybe their uh, parents had it or grandparents had it or cousins or aunts or uncles, uh, because there is a genetic risk doesn't mean that you are necessarily going to have it. So genes are not causatory for depression. That said, 
people who have higher genetic loads for depression are at much greater risk for actually experiencing depression. The alternative is also true. You might not have that much genetic risk for it. It might not exist in your family and you can still develop depression because there can be situational factors that can increase risk for depression. Um, so, you know, life experiences can result in someone developing uh, depression over time. Um, you know, certainly we see um, uh, a lot of other issues that can impact that, certain developmental time periods that people are more sensitive to develop depression. Um, particularly in the teenage years. And so there's a, a, a whole complex interweaving um, uh, model of different factors, so much so that we can't say for one particular individual, why did you develop major depression? There's a whole host of factors. You mentioned cultural issues. There are certainly things, you know, that when we look at, for example, the economy, we see a direct correlation between um, uh, and that's not a perfect correlation, but we do see a, um, uh, an association between uh, the economy taking dips and increases in suicide rates, for example. So we definitely see that. We saw that with um, uh, uh, you know, the 2008 crisis, and we've seen it with the most recent uh, uh, recession that we've had, that rates of suicide have increased. Now, economies also improved recently. We haven't yet seen rates of suicide go down, though. So, these things are very blunt. They're not a precise uh, contribution, and they're multifactorial. There's many different things that influence why one particular individual will develop depression, whereas somebody else would not. Yes? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so the, we're learning more and more about the interaction between the mind and the gut and between um, our emotional experiences and, 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 and um, what goes on inside our, our, uh, our biome inside of the gut. So I think we still have a long ways to go there. Um, with, uh, 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 with some conditions, you see a bit more of an association than you do with others. So for instance, with uh, individuals that have um, gastrointestinal issues, you will see a lot of behavioral factors that influence that. You will see also depression that influences that and stress that influences that and so on and so forth. Um, as it relates to depression more broadly, there is no um, clear indicator of nutrition that is connected as a causatory factor with that. Um, and so, uh, you know, sugar right now is a big culprit for a whole bunch of things, um, and certainly excess sugar in our diets is not good for us, broadly speaking, um, and in many different ways. Uh, but you can't pinpoint sugar, for instance, as being a primary contributor to, um, uh, to the development of, of uh, depression, for example. Certainly not within an individual, and um, uh, we haven't seen enough research to really indicate any sort of nutritional trends are a, um, a direct contribution um, to rates of depression increasing at a population level either. Uh, that said, again, there's still a lot we don't know about this. There is an increasing recognition that you can't isolate mental health problems from one's overall physical health. Uh, they are completely interconnected. Um, so it does not surprise me that over time, or will not surprise me over time, if we continue to see um, uh, interactions between our nutrition and our, our overall emotional health. Um, I believe, you know, again, if you ask any, any um, uh, psychiatrist as well as any pediatrician about this, they will say that a healthy diet is always going to be positive for your teens, right? Um, you know, people have focused on, on, on gluten, people have focused on, you know, very specific things, carbs and all of that stuff. The, uh, the data on that is highly, highly mixed, and there's actually not a lot of data about whether you take out one thing, what does that make a difference? Except, of course, with you know, people who have celiacs and other things that, where it's very clear that there's a connection. Um, generally speaking, though, outside of those, we have not seen that if you reduce this one thing or get rid of this one thing, suddenly everything clears up. We don't see that, generally speaking. Um, there's been several nutritional treatments that have been proposed out there for a variety of different things. 
they have all tended to not, um, when you put them into randomized controlled trials, they've all tended to not live up to that, um, to what they, they often promote on the commercial side of things. So my recommendation to parents is always be, give your kids a good healthy diet, be very careful unless they have clearly identified medical conditions that are associated with nu nutritional content. Be very careful about saying, well, let's go ahead and get rid of this, or let's add on a ton of this, right? Um, so for instance, you know, vitamins. Some people say, well, we're gonna go ahead and do huge amounts of vitamins because there's, a, you know, there's this company promoting this, this vitamin that's gonna cure this or that. We've actually seen kids get liver to toxicity and other kinds of things because they go too far with some of these things. So balanced diet always is gonna be helpful. Um, if something works for your kid though, do it, right? So I, you know, I'm also very pragmatic when it comes to those things. If, if, if you know, removing something from your child's diet isn't affecting their health overall and you see an improvement, I'm not gonna argue with that, right? I just won't necessarily recommend it to someone else, right? But if it works for you, do it. <laughs> yes? It's a great question. So um, there's a mix of different things. So the data that I showed you in terms of the increase uh, over that three-year period, that came from uh, uh, diagnoses from clinicians as recorded by Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? So you have to take that again with a grain of salt uh, because that just depends on who's, who's diagnosing and who's not. And there could be many reasons why that rate increases. It could be because we're increasingly recognizing it and so therefore we're, we're, we're uh, diagnosing it more. It could be an actual increase in the overall rate of depression. We don't know. Um, what we will see over time though, if you go back like say 15 years, um, you do see relatively stable trends in depression among kids when you actually look at the research literature. Um, I haven't seen anything more recent, uh, which is why I went to the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, study, because that was a more recent uh, glimpse into, into these rates. Uh, but every study you do is going to have its limitations. Every source of data is going to have its limitations. Um, so I would say that there's a possibility we might be seeing a rise right now, but we need more data points to really make that uh, determination. Uh, a lot of the studies will, however, do what's called a population survey. They will call up. Um, uh, or now, you know, using, using internet and web, um, have people go through structured clinical interviews or other forms of uh, fairly reliable and valid measures to determine rates of depression. Um, so in general, we can be fairly comfortable with the data that's out there, um, even though you're gonna see quite a bit of variability in the rates. Um, uh, in general, again, it can be a fairly large number of kids, about a third when you look over their lifetime, but again, an episode could last two, three weeks and then, and then recover. And then somebody can never have it again. So that's very different than, for instance, what we're gonna talk about in a minute, which is somebody who has persistent depression over a very long period of time. Make sense? Right there and then I'll get you, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the count. Yes. So that's a great question. There is uh, mixed data on that. Uh, some data suggests that that does help. Uh, other data suggests that that doesn't necessarily help. Um, and we don't have enough good data on that to really have a, a, a you know, conclusive decision around uh, how helpful is it versus it isn't. Um, I would certainly say that undi this is anecdotal, clinical, based on my experience, um, kids who experience uh, a major depressive episode and do not get any treatment, they're likely to not have the skills if that happens again or if that starts to increase again for them. Kids who have the skills, in my experience clinically, are often able to push off the development of uh, another depressive episode when they start to recognize the signs and then they start to use their skills, right? Now again, it's not gonna push it off if they don't recognize it or they don't use their skills even if they have had treatment. So those are my, in, from my clinical experience, the differences that I see in the kids who are more likely to get it again versus the kids who can kind of fight it off um, by using their skills. Uh, another thing that we uh, have seen some positive evidence for are potential prevention trials that have shown that early on if we can do some of this prevention work to get kids healthier overall, 
that we can forestall, number one, the onset of major depression overall. Um, they never experience it or push it off later into their life. Um, and we know if we can push it off later into their life, then it's going to be better for them overall. So there's some encouraging stuff out there, but I also don't want to overplay it because there's some evidence that suggests that treatment doesn't necessarily impact it later on. Um, but again, it's, it's a mixed bag and there's not enough good research there. Yes? That's a great question. So the question was, um, uh, depression and anxiety often occur together. Uh, and in fact, it's not uncommon to see rates of about a 70% for co-occurrence of depression and anxiety. Um, and so when, when you see depression and anxiety together, so one thing you can pretty easily differentiate depression from anxiety um, in kids who have clearly one versus the other. Uh, one of the things that um, will overlap is kind of the inattention aspect, um, the distractibility. That sometimes will look like depression, it'll look like anxiety, it'll look like ADHD, could look like other things as well, substance abuse. So that one's a really tough one sometimes. Uh, but some of these other things, you, uh, you're really only going to see in kids who have um, depression. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, excessive worries and things like that, um, you're not going to see that in a kid who only has depression and no anxiety. Um, what you are going to tend to see more is uh, that sense of, like, I'm just awful at everything. So you will see that kind of exaggerated catastrophizing um, sometimes in both kids, but it'll have a different flavor in depression versus anxiety. In anxiety, it'll be catastrophic worry. Whereas in depression, it'll be kind of this catastrophic sense of my future or sense of who I am, um, a sense of my value and things like that. Uh, so I would say clinicians can pretty well differentiate a very clear case of anxiety and a very clear, clear case of depression. But your question gets at the complication, which is that oftentimes, again, up to rates of 70% of the time, we will see depression and anxiety mixed together. Um, and so in that case, you know, I would argue that parents shouldn't be trying to figure that out by themselves. If you're seeing some of these symptoms, you need to go to a clinician and get that clinician to help you to differentiate those. Uh, we have pretty good tools to do that, um, and we can pretty reliably differentiate when somebody has depression, anxiety, or when both are going on. Um, it can be confusing, confusing sometimes when you then add in other things like ADHD and, and substance abuse, and, and it can get very complicated, but a good evaluation can really help to differentiate and, and kind of identify what's going on uh, for, for your child. Does that make sense? So it can be very confusing. And again, we often see those things co-occurring. All right, a couple other um, disorders that I wanted to keep in mind here. Uh, remember I had said that the uh, major depressive episode has to be at least two weeks? It can exist for a longer period of time as well. So it doesn't mean that it's two weeks and it's over. It can go much longer than two weeks. And in some cases what we see is, is what's referred to as de uh, persistent depressive disorder. This is when kids will have a uh, depressed mood for often uh, more than two years at a time. Uh, and that can be kind of a consistent depressed mood over that time. It can also be kind of fairly long episodes over that uh, two-year period of time. Uh, so, it, and for kids, I'm sorry, for kids it only has to be a year. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be two years is the adult criterion. For uh, kids, we're just looking at uh, depression, depressive episodes lasting over a year. And again, that doesn't mean that they are having symptoms at all, uh, all of that time, but they're never without symptoms for more than two months. So it's the vast majority of that year they are experiencing depressive symptoms. Um, and again, you can see the symptoms here are very similar, but notice how it's only two or more. So for persistent depressive disorder, you're, you don't need that same number of symptoms. It's a, it's a little bit um, a, a, a less number of symptoms because it is lasting for such a long period of time. So you do see this with some kids as well, uh, and this is important to pay attention to. You will have some kids who don't even recognize that they're depressed. They just think that this is the way I am. They think that I'm always low energy, I'm always pessimistic, I'm always kind of down and sad. Well, that's actually a disorder, right? That's something we can help them with. 
And so we need to let the kids know this is not just you. Something's going on, and, and let's get you some help for it. Um, another one that you do see with um, girls is uh, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. This is a fairly controversial disorder, um, mostly because of um, some influences from the drug companies around this. And so do take this one with a grain of salt as well. That said, there is some pretty good data to support uh, a change in um, uh, depressive symptoms that is concurrent with the menstrual cycle. Um, you can kind of see it down here with looking at um, uh, ovulation and irritability. Uh, and so this is, again, going to be at a very significant level, not any typical moodiness that might be associated with the, the ovulation cycle here. Another one to pay attention to that's relatively new is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Uh, this is really characterizing those kids who have really severe, frequent, uh, and reactive temper outbursts mixed with chronic, severe, and persistent irritability. So these aren't those kids that are irritable during a major depressive episode. These are kids who are kind of chronically irritable as well as having these anger and emotional outbursts. Uh, this actually was developed about, um, uh, gosh, about uh, back in 2013 in response to an overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder in kids. Uh, there was a lot of, of um, uh, a huge tendency back then to just give lots of kids a bipolar diagnosis when they didn't really have it. What they actually had was this. They had persistent mood dysregulation um, that was a combination of this reactivity, this anger, uh, this, this um, uh, aggression mixed with kind of this chronic irritability. And there's some who have said, oh, this is just a temper, a temper uh, tantrum. This will, you know, this will just make every kid have a temper. Te with a temper tantrum, we'll get a mental disorder. Um, uh, and, you know, he, the person who wrote this wrote this whole book on, you know, how we're diagnosing all this normal stuff now. Uh, well, the data don't support that. When you look at the data, um, sorry, that got a little uh, off there. Uh, but when you look at the data, it's not a huge number of kids that meet this. Uh, it's going to be anywhere between 0.8 to 3.3 percent. And it's even lower when you get rid of preschoolers, right? So the, you're not allowed to diagnose preschoolers with this. You have to be uh, six or above to even get this diagnosis. Um, and it is associated with pretty significant impairment. So for that reason, we don't think it's just over patho uh, pathologizing kids' behavior. These are kids who are experiencing significant problems at home and at school. Um, so this is capturing something out there. Um, so that's another one to pay attention to that's relatively new. All right. Um, I know we don't have a ton. We're supposed to end at 1, right? Is that true? No? Till what time? I had it in my appointment for 1. Does anybody know how long? I'm just going to keep talking then. All right. You all can stay as long as you want. How's that? Um, so we're going to move on to non-suicidal self-injury. But before we do that, um, questions, concerns so far on just the general overall understanding of depression and their associated disorders? Yes? I, I was kind of surprised that young women had a higher rate of depression with their school loss. So that's clinically determined, right? Yeah, so. Self reporting? Yeah, so that would be, well, you see it both with self report and you also see it with structured clinical interviews. Um, and you also see that to uh, a fairly large extent for adults as well. Um, for when you're looking at adult men versus women, you see uh, rates of depression are higher uh, in, in, in women versus men, both in terms of uh, broad diagnoses that you might get um, through a health system. You also see it in terms of um, who receives treatment. And then you also see it through research with structured diagnostic interviews. And so you do, but again, it happens at that point of puberty is when you see that differentiation. Now, the um, uh, suicide rate is opposite, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna get to that in a little bit, but the, um, the suicide rate is actually much higher for men than it is for women. And so sometimes people get confused about that, but that has a lot to do with the methodology that is used uh, and the differences in what uh, methods people use to kill themselves between men and between women. Um, but rates of depression, generally speaking, are, are higher, higher for women post-puberty. Post Do you think that's attributed to gender 
There certainly is a question on that, yes. So there's a big discussion um, uh, that comes up quite a bit around do we, do we need gender specific criteria? And that's true for a lot of different disorders. There's a lot of questions about that across these disorders. There is certainly a, a question of, you know, is there a cultural stigma that's higher for males than for females? Um, could perhaps men be depressed in different ways, which is maybe manifested through anger, which is maybe manifested through substance abuse, which is maybe manifested through overworking, a whole bunch of things, isolation from family, but maybe not from other people. So there's a whole bunch of things that can make this very complicated. Um, and there are people who will, will argue that males um, do have higher rates of depression because we don't have the right criteria for males. Uh, there's also this concept called uh, normative male alexithymia, uh, which is this sense that males, broadly speaking, don't have a good understanding, comparatively to women, don't have a good understanding of their emotions. So they can't even necessarily tap into their emotional experiences in a way that they are even able to express uh, feelings of depression. So that concept of normative male alexithymia uh, can also become non-normative in the sense that it leads, it leads a male to then act out rather than experience their emotional experiences. But again, that's a, it's a very controversial area, um, and so there's, a, there's, you know, I wouldn't say there's anything definitive on that. But a very good point. Yes? So DMDD is relatively new. We don't know a whole lot about it. Um, let me see. Yeah, I don't have any data on here differentiating. I was hope, I, hoping I did because I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, I do believe you're seeing a higher rate in males than females, but because this, was, this diagnosis came about in 2013, uh, we don't have a ton of good information on that. If you follow up with me, I'm sure I can find some, though, about what are the differences. But off the top of my head, I don't know it. Yes? For, uh, I wouldn't say for a lot of it. I would say that that gender differentiating that you see with puberty has been attributed to different experiences of hormones between males and females. So there is a contribution uh, of that system um, to depression. Uh, but again, it's multifactorial, right? So that's not the only reason. Um, but certainly that's been the argument about why you see that gender difference around the age of puberty is having to do with um, uh, differences in hormonal experience. Absolutely. You know, but again, it's not causatory, uh, it's contributory, right? So it contributes to, but doesn't necessarily cause it. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so seasonal affective disorder is actually a specific or a specifier that you can have with major depressive disorder. And for those that aren't familiar, seasonal affective is when the depression symptoms co-occur with different times of the year, often associated with different exposure to light. Um, so right now we're in the dark period of our season. And so some people experience greater rates of depression during this period. Um, and uh, individuals who have that specifier of a seasonal affective um, uh, 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 type of uh, depression often respond to light therapy, uh, more so than, than patients that don't have that. Um, and light therapy is basically an experience of um, uh, bright lights, uh, uh, specifically therapeutic bright lights uh, that in many ways um, uh, simulate the, the sun and provide that, um, that sun that some people need. And that can really help them to get through the, the darker times. Uh, there is some research on vitamin D. I don't know it off the top of my head, um, but I think it actually is, this is one of those areas where you do see um, I believe some of some positive effects, but I don't know it well enough to, to comment it on it in, uh, in any depth. Uh, but I do believe I remember seeing some stuff associated with vitamin D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's, uh, 
there are certain types of lights that are specifically designed to be therapeutic lights. And I would work with a clinician around determining which ones would be best. There's a lot, there's a lot of people wanting to sell a lot of things in the mental health world. And this is why I'm always very cautious about you know, things like that. I would not recommend tanning um, for multiple reasons because tanning is, is a clear increase of risk for skin cancer. So that, that is a very clear um, uh, causatory impact on risks for skin cancer, particularly these days as our, our protection is, is limiting, uh, are, are increasingly uh, becoming limited with the ozone layer. Um, so I would not recommend tanning. I also don't believe that is the same type of light that, um, that, that would be beneficial. Um, there, we do have some experts in the city of Chicago who, who work in this area, so I would defer more to the clinicians on that in terms of identifying the right lights to use. And, and again, I, go, I would uh, strongly recommend the therapeutic lights that are out there. I don't know what the blue light might be. It might be a very good therapeutic light. It also could be something that somebody just created because they thought it looked good, or they're trying to steal from others and made something else. So, I always am very cautious about the commercialization of mental health treatments. Um, you know, that said, if it works for them, although I don't like the tanning, if it works for them, if the blue light works for them and it's not causing any other problems, um, largely speaking, blue lights from our phones are not good for us at nighttime and things like that. But if it's working for them, I'm a pragmatic person. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna interrupt something that's working for them as long as it doesn't cause any other problems. Any other questions about this? Excellent, okay, let's talk a little bit about non-suicidal self-injury. Um, people may be familiar with what this is. Uh, this is the definition, it's the deliberate self-inflicted destruction of one's body tissue um, without wanting to die, so it has no suicidal intent, and it is for purposes not socially sanctioned. When would somebody destroy their or hurt their own bodily tissue for socially sanctioned reasons? Pierced ears, tattoos, right? Any sort of body modification or body art. Um, you know, even if you don't socially sanction it, it's generally not considered uh, non-suicidal self-injury, all right? So what is the common thing that people know about as it relates to non-suicidal self-injury? Cutting, right? So cutting is a lot of times what people think of. We use the term non-suicidal self-injury uh, because it is, it is not, uh, first of all, it's very descriptive um, and it's not pejorative. Sometimes you hear people referred to as cutters. We don't want to label them that. It's much easier to change behavior. It's very hard to change identity. So if somebody says, I'm a cutter, that's a lot harder than saying, I engage in, I cut myself sometimes to feel better, right? Uh, how common it is, it's actually quite common. So when you look at, uh, and you ask, this is a, a college population sample, and you ask them, have you ever, you know, purposely hurt yourself um, without wanting to die, uh, about, um, uh, 18% will say yes. This pie graph's a little goofy, sorry. Um, I should have bars up here. 18% um, will say yes, uh, and 7% will say in the past year. That 7% should be part of that 18%. That's why this, uh, I just realized this pie graph is wrong. Um, so a good number of people will actually indicate that. There's some rates that are up to about 30% uh, in some samples um, have shown that, that by the time kids get to college, they've engaged in, in non-suicidal self-injury. Um, what is it? Yes, to a large degree, it is cutting of the skin, um, oftentimes using a razor or a knife, um, but it's not just cutting of the skin. So that's why we call it non-suicidal self-injury. It could be a variety of different things. Scraping or scratching the skin is also common, banging their heads or their, their limbs, choking themselves, burning, preventing wounds from healing, you know, ripping scabs open, things like that, drawing blood out of their body. Could be a whole host of different things. Um, that kids could engage in. What we typically experience at the clinical level is that most kids that engage in non-suicidal self-injury do two or more uh, different types of things other than just cutting. Um, so that's why, again, we refer to it as non-suicidal self-injury. Now, this is very different than a suicide attempt. M many reasons why. Number one, the methods are very different, but also because it is usually very mild. Right? It's a very mild injury. By mild, I mean it doesn't even require a bandage. Um, so when we look at uh, the majority of people who engage in, in self-injury, uh, they don't even need any sort of medical care. Uh, if they do need medical care, they can usually do it themselves with a bandage. Um, and a very small number actually require treatment 
uh, by a nurse or at the hospital. So again, it's very different than a suicide attempt. Um, a lot of times you might hear this being referred to um, uh, in conjunction with borderline personality disorder. Uh, what we can tell you fairly definitive is that it is not all borderline personality disorder. Uh, what we will see is a, a range of borderline personality traits that kids may experience when they are self-injuring. Um, and so some kids will have very, very high traits, some will have none. And that's what we have found over and over again with our research, um, is that it's a wide range of traits um, for uh, borderline personality disorder. So it's not all just people who have borderline personality disorder. It is, however, mostly people who have what we refer to as affective disorders. So 92.4% of our patients that we've treated with non-suicidal self-injury have either major depression, episodic mood disorders, some other kind of depression, or bipolar disorder. So almost all of them are experiencing significant affective disorders. So that's one of the reasons I bring it up in a talk about depression. Why do people do this? That's always the big question. Why would you hurt yourself without wanting to die? Well, the primary reason is to make themselves feel better. It's to regulate their mood. Uh, we have lots of lots of research that shows right before a kid engages in non-suicidal self-injury, they're very upset, and then they engage in non-suicidal self-injury and they feel better. So why do they do it? Because it makes them feel better, okay? It might be counterintuitive to you. I was just working with a kid um, yesterday and uh, he had engaged in two different times uh, 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 cutting behavior. Uh, and I said, have you done it any more than that? He goes, no, you know, I tried it one more time. It didn't work, I didn't like it, right? Didn't regulate for him, guess what? He's never doing it again because it didn't work for him. There are other kids though where it works, it's effective, so then they keep doing it, all right? Uh, so that's a huge reason why they do it, but it's not the only reason. They also do it as a way of punishing themselves. Remember that symptom of self-hatred that we saw with major depression? This is something that we see with a lot of people who engage in non-suicidal self-injury, is they hate themselves, so they're punishing themselves. They're, they're hurting themselves on purpose because they feel that they are awful and that they deserve the pain. So that's what we're seeing a lot as well. Some will experience dissociative experience where they feel outside of their body, they feel disconnected with the world, so they self-injure as a way of feeling something, right? It's a way of becoming not numb anymore. Um, they also may do it to, to show how, much, um, how upset they are, both to themselves as well as to others. They also may do it to kind of create a sense of, I am unique, I am different from other people, I am somebody who does this rather than something like, uh, or, or, rather than something else that another group might do. Some do it as a form of, well, I, I can't take care of myself emotionally, but if I self-injure, I can then take care of the wound. So it's a form of self-care, um, a kind of a display self-care. And then again, some do it again to, to develop that sense of uniqueness about themselves, that autonomy, um, or that interpersonal boundary. Does that make sense? It's very different than suicide. I'm not going to go into length about this, uh, but generally speaking, the injuries are not life-threatening. Um, the functions are very different. The functions are actually to feel better, to continue on, to cope, to persist, uh, uh, to get better, whereas suicidal self-injury is to die. It's to make it all end. It's to escape it all. It's to get a final solution. The methods are very different, as we talked about. Um, the psychological impact, again, is very different. Usually when someone engages in a suicidal self-injury, there might be some relief right after that, that they didn't die. There also might be some distress, because now they have to continue to deal with what they were trying to escape from. Generally speaking, with non-suicidal self-injury, they feel better after it. Now, does that last? No, it doesn't last. So they end up having to self-injure again and again and again to keep that um, uh, experience to keep their emotions regulated. So ultimately over time it's not very effective even though in the moment it can be very effective for them. Uh, with suicidal self-injury luckily it's not that frequent whereas with self-injury, non-suicidal self-injury uh, kids can, I, we've had kids do it multiple times a day. Um, some will report hundreds of times a week that they engage in non-suicidal self-injury. Um, now, not every kid does it that frequently. Some kids do it, you know, infrequently, but we do see a much, much higher frequency than we have with suicidal self-injury. 
All right, so we have been talking about non-suicidal self-injury, which has a lot to do with suicide, so I want to briefly touch about suicide in children and adolescents um, and see if we can get an understanding of both how severe this is and then move into talking about what we can do about all of this. So when we think about um, suicide, we know that unfortunately it's actually quite common. When you ask kids um, in the last year, this is a high school sample, this is, these are data that are done every single year, national representative sample, uh, a research sample, 17% will indicate at least some serious suicidal ideation in the last year. That's out of a general population high school sample, 17%. Um, now, these kids may or may not be depressed. You can have suicidal thoughts without necessarily being depressed, all right? but majority of them are probably also experiencing major depression. 13.6%, this is shocking to me, 13.6% will indicate that they had developed a plan in the last year. Now, this is self-report data, so there might be some exaggeration, but there also might be underreporting. Um, so we're kind of uh, taking it at face value. About 13% will indicate that they have developed a plan, and 7% will indicate that they made an attempt in the last year. So these rates are really high. I would say you know, we're at a crisis point in this country as it relates to, to suicide. Uh, when you look at the rates, um, and this, uh, this hasn't been updated, uh, we're always about two years behind in our, our rates, but uh, this, unfortunately this trend has continued to increase. Uh, what we have seen is since the, um, uh, since the bubble burst in 2008, that rates for um, suicide among kids and adults, but in particular kids, have really increased and escalated after a very long period of decreasing rates of suicide. So we actually did a very good job of making our population healthier, our kids healthier, but unfortunately we've lost some gain in that um, over the last several years, particularly um, uh, with females, we're actually at the highest rate it's ever been. Right? Males is still much lower than its worst time during the mid-90s, uh, but we are seeing r females the highest ever. Yes? Correct. So that's actually numbers 100, per 100,000. So if you take 100,000 kids, um, 12, 12 died uh, you know, at that particular 1975. Um, 14 died out of 100,000. Yeah, so those are actual numbers. Um, well, 90s were rough overall uh, for kids in terms of mental health. Broadly speaking, uh, it was the death from homicide, for example, was the highest it ever was for kids. Um, uh, it was also one of the worst times for um, drug abuse for kids as well. So most indicators of risk for kids were the absolute highest during the 90s. It was the it was the crack um, decade, uh, the epidemic of, the, of uh, crack cocaine was one of its highest at that point. Whether that explains it, I don't know. Um, you know but that is one of the things that is associated with at least the violence. There's some, some indication that the violence rates were the highest because of that. Suicide, I don't know. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, what I will say is that, whoops, uh, what I will say is that we have figured out and implemented a lot of prevention programs and we've also introduced a lot of um, uh, pharmacologic treatments, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, began to be uh, more commonly uh, prescribed during that period of time. So we, I believe, prevention and intervention efforts have influenced the drop over time. Um, but why this built up and stayed high for so long, I can't tell you. Yes? Yes, uh, I took out slides on that as well from my usual talk. Yeah, and so you do see some significant differences. So generally speaking, uh, Native American populations uh, have up to three times the, the risk for children and adolescents of, of death from suicide. Um, then you're looking at non-Hispanic whites. Um, then you're looking at um, uh, typically Latinx populations, Hispanic populations. Uh, then after that, African American um, and uh, Asian populations. That's going to be your, your racial ethnic differences. They're pretty stark differences. Um, you, uh, uh, in terms of socioeconomic, I don't know those off the top of my head and I'm not sure how clear those are. Um, I do know there are urban-rural differences as well with rates much higher in rural areas. Um, mostly uh, mostly has, that's been attributed to a lot of the social, social isolation as well as lack of services um, in those areas. But you do see pretty significant geographic trends. Um, you, we have some maps that show differences in that as well. Yeah. 
So you do see some pretty significant socio-demographic differences. In Illinois, we've seen um, uh, that same increase in the suicide rate. This is between 2007 and 2015. Again, that same huge uh, jump in, in females um, that we're seeing nationally as well. So unfortunately, we've been impacted by this just as much as the, the rest of the country. Um, if we have time, Gilda, do we still have time? Okay, um, and thank you all for staying. We're gonna run through some quick myths versus facts. Uh, I always find this very important to do with parents because a lot of times we get the wrong information about this. Um, so one of the myths that we often see is that people who talk about suicide aren't serious about it. If you're talking about it, you're really not planning it. That's not true. Most people who um, actually complete a suicide attempt, who die from suicide, haven't, have said something to somebody in some way, right? Uh, so many people who die have given definite warning signs, even if they didn't say it directly, they have given some warning signs. People always, generally, not always, mostly look back and say, oh, now I see what they were trying to communicate to me, right? So we shouldn't assume that if they're talking about it, that it, they're not serious about it. Take every indication about suicide serious. Uh, suicide happens without warning. Again, not true. There's usually lots of warning signs that somebody is at risk for suicide. Most people show very clear um, clues and, and um, indicators that things are not going right for them, that they're very upset. Asking a depressed person about um, uh, suicide will push them to consider or complete suicide. Absolutely not. Lots and lots of research that shows that when you ask about suicide, you actually reduce risk not increase risk, particularly when you ask in the appropriate manner, when you ask in a, in a clinical, uh, care, uh, caring kind of manner. Um, there's no indication that asking about suicide increases risk or plants that in somebody's mind. That's just not, um, uh, not true. Sometimes a bad event can push a person to complete suicide. Again, this is highly, highly unlikely. There will almost always be an intervening mental disorder. Most of the people that die from suicide, 95 to 99 percent, depends on the study you look at, there is an identifiable mental disorder uh, in that individual. It's very rare that somebody, something bad will happen and then they'll just kill themselves, right? Does happen, you can find examples, but it's very, very rare, right? There's almost always a mental disorder that is in between that. A couple things up here, early warning signs, things to pay attention to. Uh, these are things that might suggest something's not going on or going right with your teen. So again, that social isolation, that withdrawal, the preoccupation with death, that marked personality uh, change or serious change in mood, difficulty concentrating, is this sounding familiar? Um, difficulties in school, decline in quality of work, change in eating, loss of interest. So a lot of those signs of depression are our early warning signs um, that, that uh, things are not going right. But there's also what we refer to as late warning signs or imminent warning signs, things that suggest that they might be thinking about doing something in the near future. So talking about death a lot, actually engaging in self-harm behavior, non-suicidal self-injury is actually one of the strongest predictors of somebody who will engage in a suicide attempt. And the reason behind that is that non-suicidal self-injury is seen as practice in many ways. Even though it's not intended, it's intended to feel better what it does is it desensitizes somebody to the thought of hurting themselves. It takes a lot for us to kill ourselves. It takes a lot to overcome that instinct we have to live and to persevere. Um, in fact, has, any, has anybody seen the movie The Bridge? Um, this is a documentary of the Golden Gate Bridge and suicides, uh, yes. And so if you look at anybody that they interviewed who survived from jumps, suicide attempts, they all indicate that as soon as their feet left the bridge, they regretted it. Right? That instinct is strong in us. And so it takes a lot to overcome that, and self-injury is kind of a way that preps the body for overcoming that. So again, that is going to be an indicator that, they, um, that they should be, uh, you should be concerned about that. Um, when, when they see uh, suicide in others, that can be a trigger for some of our kids. They have a, a friend who suicides, or they hear about a suicide in another neighborhood or another um, uh, school, that can be a trigger for them. Um, impulsive behaviors, violent actions, rebellious behaviors that are different than normal, running away, um, kids who refuse help say that they're beyond help, that's a clear indicator that they're, they've given up, that they feel hopeless, uh, complaining they are a bad person or feeling rotten inside, again that goes to that self-hatred that we talked about, uh, and again making statements of hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness, they're actually saying these things, that's an indicator that they're really not doing well. 
Um, again, some more of these, not tolerating praise or rewards, uh, giving hints, it won't be a problem for you much longer. Oh, don't worry about that. Um, it'll all, it, you know, it'll be fine soon. When they start saying things like that, that means they've made a decision. They're going to do something, right? It's no use. I won't see you again. Um, suddenly becoming cheerful. So maybe they've been depressed for a while, and suddenly they seem fine. And you're like, whew, you're relieved. No, they've probably made a decision, right? They've now solved the problem because they're thinking about killing themselves, so now they don't have to worry about anything anymore. So a sudden improvement is something you need to be very careful about, okay? Um, giving away favorite possessions, uh, making a last will and testament, saying things like, you know, saying it directly, communicating it directly to someone, I'm going to do something, I'm going to hurt myself. So these are all late warning signs, things to, to know that you need to immediately start to uh, at least assess or intervene. Any questions? I know it's a heavy, heavy topic, both non-suicidal self-injury and suicide, but I wanted to make sure you at least had that information. Yes? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple, couple ideas around that. Number one is it's very easy for a caregiver to feel fatigued. Um, and it's also very easy for not only caregivers, but also supports, uh, you know, both clinical and school supports to start thinking, oh, they say this all the time, we don't need to take it serious. The problem is we never know when they're going to be serious, right? We never know. Um, when is going to be the time that they decide, you know what, this time I'm actually going to carry through with it. So we do need to, as you said, always take it seriously. Um, the, so a couple ideas. One is that you can um, uh, really do a thorough assessment every time there's, a, there's an indication of suicide to help to clarify, is it active thoughts of suicide but no real intention? Is there no plan? Um, you could start to delineate some of that and that can ease and you can communicate that with the parents. Um, and that can help to give you an idea of the severity because some of our kids experience chronic suicidal thinking. And that is not necessarily uncommon in kids who experience persistent depressive disorder with suicidal thoughts. So helping them to understand when their thoughts of suicide are kind of more chronic thoughts of suicide um, that don't really need any additional action or resources, or when it's really getting serious. And again, when it's getting serious is when it moves from just a general wish to be dead, to active thoughts of suicide, to then having um, um, some intent, uh, to having some plans. Uh, that's when it starts to, or understanding method overall, those are the levels where you start to get more concerned. And so helping the parent know your son indicated some thoughts of, of suicide today, but it's a level one, right? It didn't go to level two. Right? So communicating that to the parents so that they can say, okay, you know, I don't have to freak out. This is what it is. But we're going to continue to monitor. We're going to see if it gets worse than a level one. Yes. Yeah, and it very well may be. So, you know, he's, he sounds like he's playing around with, with different methods. Um, and, you know, that would be what we generally consider kind of a level three um, uh, suicidal ideation. And so he's kind of thinking and, and exploring different things, but also thinking of the consequences of them. And that's actually something you want to uh, reinforce with him even more so, is what help him to evaluate the positives and negatives of these different things. Not to help him to get on a particular method, but to identify that, yes, these things have implications. You know, if you did this, what would happen? A lot of kids think, if I did this, everyone would be happier. No, everyone would be miserable. Everyone would be horrible, right? This would not make anybody else feel better. Um, it would not reduce a burden on your parents. It would add a whole other burden onto them. 
So that can be a useful discussion with them. Um, but yeah, a lot of kids are working this through because they're looking for an escape. They're looking for a final solution. They're looking for a way to stop it all. And they can't, right? They can't find a way because all the tools that we give them might be able to help and over long term will help really well if they do them, but they're not helping right then and there. Thinking about suicide can help them right then and there as a way to just escape everything. So one thing you can do is help him to identify when I have a suicidal thought, that's me wanting a quick solution. So what can I do instead? Helping and giving him alternative ways of thinking and alternative ways of acting and alternative ways of in interpreting what a suicidal thought is for him, right? Is it that I truly want to die right now? It doesn't sound like it. What it sounds like is I really want things to be different right now. So how do I communicate that differently than through a suicidal uh, thought? That's what I would work on with him, is really develop some plans for that. Okay, I see what you're doing right now. Let's go to our plan, right? Remember what our plan is for when you're having these thoughts. We're going to instead interpret it in a different way. Does that make sense? So again, I think a combination of, of doing that assessment, communicating that assessment, and also getting him on a plan to think differently about those suicidal thoughts. Any other thoughts about that? Again, it can be quite heavy. The good part is that there are treatments available, right? So there's lots of different treatments that are available for um, uh, depression. Um, they have been shown to have a level of, a good level of effectiveness. Um, the reason I don't say they're effective, they're not effective for everybody, okay? And they're not effective for everybody the first time. Sometimes they're effective the second time, right? So we don't have a magical cure here. We don't have a magical pill, but we ha have some treatments that can be very effective with a good proportion of kids who experience depression. Generally speaking, rates indicate, um, uh, recovery rates are about 50% in response to this, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that then the other 50% never respond. It just means that they don't respond perhaps that time. And so what we do see, for instance, is cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, dialectical behavior, um, uh, multisystemic therapy, but that's very expensive and never offered. It has to be state funded. I should just remove it because nobody ever can do it. But these other three are fairly popular. Uh, these are things that, that you can find out in the community. So for instance, with cognitive behavioral therapy, what you're really going at is understanding the connection between thoughts, feelings, behavior. Right? So the kid uh, that you're talking about who has these thoughts of suicide, right? he's also having thoughts of, um, I just want to get away from it all. I want to escape from all of that. Right? Well, how does that make him feel? Right? And, and what, how does that affect his behavior? All of these things are connected. Uh, so the way we think affects the way we feel, the way we feel affects the way we think, and they all affect the way we behave. Um, and a lot of our kids engage in what's called emotion-driven behavior. This is behavior to escape their aversive emotions, to get away from the bad feelings that they don't like. That's why kids engage in non-suicidal self-injury, to escape those feelings. That's why they engage in thoughts about suicide, because it'll help them to escape from those negative feelings that they don't want. So a lot of this is getting kids to understand and accept the feelings that they're having without trying to avoid them, without trying to get away from them. That's a huge part of what we do in cognitive behavioral therapy. So understanding feelings, thoughts, and how they affect behavior. And then really examining our thoughts. Are our thoughts accurate? Everybody hates you. Oh, what's your evidence for that? What about these three friends that you have? Well, everybody but them. OK, well, how do you know people hate you? Uh, because they tell me. Who told you in the last week? Nobody. Well, so then how do you know they hate you? Right? So helping them to understand that maybe some of the thoughts they have aren't fully accurate. Right? Um, that they can think more positively and more accurately about what's going on in their world. Also learning new skills to behave in more positive ways um, and to really practice these skills both at home and at school. If all they do is use these skills in the clinic, they're useless. They have to be doing them at home. They have to be doing them at school. Okay? And they have to be reinforced by you all. Okay? Uh, the outcomes for CBT are generally very good. Uh, this is a list of about 11 different studies showing an effect size. An effect size is just how strong is the effect of the treatment on um, symptoms of depression. Generally, anything um, uh, above a 0.8 is considered to be a fairly strong effect. Um, most of ours are fairly effective. You know, studies uh, have shown that it's fairly effective. You know, some lesser than others, right? So again, this is why I say we have some that demonstrate some effectiveness. 
Uh, they can be very effective for individuals. They don't work for everybody, okay? Um, this is uh, another kind of plot showing, um, this is showing favoring the treatment. This is for group treatment as well. So group treatment as well as individual treatment has shown to be effective for youth um, and also for children as well. So we're seeing, you know, that um, uh, there's positivity in the outcomes that you see for uh, child as well as uh, adolescents. So overall, we have some good evidence to support cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, that's not the only thing out there. There's also dialectical behavior therapy particularly for kids who experience really significant emotional reactivity, kids who have any traits of borderline personality disorder, kids who engage in non-suicidal self-injury or suicide, um, or suicide attempts, uh, dialectical behavior therapy can be very helpful, more so than uh, CBT in some instances. Um, when you're looking at uh, dialectical behavior therapy, you're really looking at changing how uh, people regulate their emotions, but not only their emotions, you're also looking at how they change their interaction with others to get them to be more effective in how they're dealing with others. Um, and also to work on their overall self-regulation, such as their sense of identity, who they are, getting them to have an identity separate from, I'm the messed up kid, I'm the problem kid, I'm the cutter kid, getting them to have a good identity about themselves and to fill any uh, sense of emptiness they may have, give them um, a life that's worth living. And also to decrease any of these behaviors that tend to uh, be highly dysregulatory, such as non-suicidal self-injury, suicidal behaviors, but also um, impulsive, emotion-driven behaviors, that avoidant behavior that we talk about, trying to escape the emotions. No, instead we want to experience the emotions, accept the emotions, and realize that if we do that, we're gonna be okay. Right? Realize that there isn't a threshold of emotion where I'm suddenly going to blow up or I'm suddenly going to lose it. No, you can handle your emotions. It's just that you tend to run from them so you never give yourself an opportunity to experience them. So a huge part of all these treatments is exposing one to emotion, getting kids to accept and to be comfortable with experiencing intense emotions. That's underlying a lot of these treatments. Um, and then finally, some you know, cognitive uh, dysregulation when people are dissociating or feeling paranoid to realize how to address that. So again, that's generally what you see with dialectical behavior therapy. Um, this can be a, um, a very comprehensive long-term treatment, uh, but often the, the, um, uh, the major part of what you're going to be doing is in these first three stages here. I'm not going to go into detail about this. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, there's very few people who do full DBT. Full DBT requires 24 hours, uh, seven days a week access and a whole treatment team and it's very intense. Many clinicians, however, integrate DBT into what they do, integrate a lot of the skills into what they do and recent evidence suggests that that's effective too. You don't have to necessarily, unless you have somebody with full on borderline personality disorder, you don't necessarily need to have the entire treatment package there. But if you do have somebody who has a lot of traits, a teen with a lot of traits of borderline personality disorder, and by the way, I should have put up a slide on that. I apologize about what that is. Um, uh, but the, uh, for somebody who has a true borderline personality disorder, even at a very young age, and that does exist, um, you do sometimes see that in adolescence, then full-on DBT is, is really necessary. But otherwise, elements of DBT have been shown to be effective in some of these other areas as well. A lot of research still needs to be done, but it's promising. Medications often come up when we're talking about self, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, depression. Uh, when we think about it, antidepressants, everybody's aware of all the different classes of antidepressants out there. Uh, so the most common are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, you also, though, have some atypicals. Uh, well, Biotrin uh, is one of the more common ones, but uh, has fallen off, I think, over time. Um, you do get some of the older medications that can be used at times when SSRIs don't aren't as effective, such as uh, uh, tricyclics um, or uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, these tend to have pretty significant side effects. Uh, so generally speaking, we try to stick with SSRIs um, uh, in general. The uh, reason that I like to focus on medications, I'm not a psychiatrist, so it's not something that I know a whole lot about. I don't pretend to have expertise in this area. But the reason I like to make everybody aware of this is that uh, back in, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, early 2000s, they put on a black box warning on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for kids. And that black box warning basically said that this may increase your child's risk of suicide. Um, 
you're like, wait a second, this is an antidepressant, it's supposed to help with this, and you're telling me this may increase this. This comes from some research that showed that there was a 1.95 increase in thoughts about suicide um, for kids that um, had an SSRI versus kids that didn't have an SSRI. Let's put that in reality, though. That was a 2% versus a 4%. 96% of the kids on an SSRI did not have an increase in suicidal thoughts. So the vast, vast majority are not affected um, in terms of their thoughts about suicide as it relates to an SSRI. Um, and for adults, you don't see that risk. It's just something linked to kids. We don't know necessarily exactly what that means. It, there's some theory that there's an activating effect of the, the drug, um, but with that activating effect, there's still the thoughts of, of um, wanting to die, right? So there's an idea that that might increase those thoughts because now they're more active. They're less, uh, uh, less kind of overall subdued in that sense. Um, the issue with that is that the only evidence was in thoughts of suicide. There was no increase in actual risk for suicidal attempts. That is key. It was just thoughts about suicide and 96% of them did not experience that. So it was not a huge increase. The problem with this, though, is that uh, that black box warning led to a lot of people getting out of treatment. Uh, there was a 20% decrease in antidepressants, yet no increase in psychotherapy. In fact, psychotherapy dropped, too. Um, we saw a huge rate of uh, decrease in the number of kids diagnosed with depression in that year after the black box warning, which meant that parents just stopped trusting the mental health field. Uh, a huge problem. And what did we see in that year? An increase in suicide. It was the one year in that 15-year trend of decreasing rates of suicide where we saw an increase. Uh, what does that tell me? It tells me that when we don't provide kids the treatments that they need, we increase the risk that they might die from this, right? So this black box warning was a huge, in my opinion, a huge blunder by the FDA. Um, there is a slight increased risk for suicidal thoughts. Um, oh, this is the, uh, the decrease in psychotherapy. So why would people stop getting psychotherapy? It has nothing to do with medication. Again, it resulted in people not trusting the mental health field, and that killed kids, in my opinion. Um, I don't have direct evidence of that, but that's, that's my opinion about this. Um, so I tell you all, so this is the increase in, in suicide that you saw during that, that time period before the recession hit and before we saw that other increased risk. Um, so I'm telling you all because you might see that black box warning and freak out, okay? I want you to know what that black box warning means. And I want you to know that if you are getting both medication and cognitive behavioral therapy or another kind of treatment, your risk for suicide actually decreases, okay? So, and this is a study that showed that, that yes, there's a, um, uh, thoughts about suicide were higher on medication only, right? They were lower when people got CBT, when they got both CBT and medication, CBT being cognitive behavioral therapy. When they got both, um, they still had a fairly low risk for suicidal thoughts, okay? So if you're worried about it, make sure your child is also in good psychotherapy. All right, I think that's about it. Um, I'm more than happy to stay as long as we're not getting kicked out. I'm more than happy to stay and answer additional questions, thoughts, concerns. I know I kind of rushed through that last part of it. Um, but any questions on treatment and, and how um, uh, overall about depression and suicide or non-suicidal self-injury? Yes? Yeah, uh, there are. So one of the things when, when um, one of the things that can be um, effective, particularly for more mild or moderate depression, would be what's called behavioral activation. Just getting them to do more, getting them to hang out more with other people, getting them to just go for a walk, getting them to go out and do activities. Um, setting up pleasure scheduling is the is the technical term that we use for it, but setting up activities that they used to find pleasurable and just getting them out and doing things. Increasing activity level can help a lot of times, if, particularly if a depression is starting to set in, that can sometimes uh, uh, prevent it from really digging in. Absolutely. Yes? Mm -hmm. Would that take care of a big hunk of the depression? No, 
Um, there's, there's no silver bullet. Um, you know, I think what you're talking about more broadly speaking is, is general positive mental health. I think generally speaking, we need more of that. But what we've really, what we've really seen is that the, the key parts of this is understanding emotional experience, accepting emotional experience. I think you had the question before about males, right? Um, it goes back to really understanding my emotional experiences, not rejecting those emotional experiences. Understanding that my behavior does not have to result from my emotional experience. Just because I feel angry, I don't have to punch a wall, right? That's a choice I'm making, to punch a wall. Um, just because I'm feeling angry doesn't mean I have to do something to decrease that emotion. Just because I'm feeling sad doesn't mean I need to do something to decrease that emotion. What we've found is that over, over all of these things, understanding your emotions, understanding how your thoughts, emotions, and behavior are connected, um, and accepting your emotions are the key aspects to this. And those can be very preventative. Having goals, very, very good. There's lots of kids who are high performing, lots of goals, and super depressed, right? There's other kids who have no goals, and they're chilling. Like, life is good. They're just kind of wandering through. They're not depressed, right? So those things can be useful overall for kids to be um, healthy, but doesn't mean it's necessarily going to impact their depression, right? Um, Humility, I think, gets at a different thing that you're getting at as it relates to, I think, our current zeitgeist where everything's all about the self, you know, the selfie world that we have right now. Um, I think that's a broader cultural issue, and I think that does have mental health impacts, but I don't know the research. Well, there is some research on that. So kids that use Facebook a lot um, have higher rates of depression than kids that don't use Facebook as much. Um, so there is some of that. And again, a lot of that is, has been argued to be not only this, this um, uh, you know, internal sense of like, I'm gonna focus on myself and present myself to the world, but it's also seeing all these other people who are presenting these fake lives and thinking my life is never gonna be as good as them. You know, so it's this constant comparison effect that, that leads to this sense of inadequacy among kids. Um, so yes, I think the humility thing, I think gets to a broader thing that we're having right now in our culture that I think is, is personally a little scary. Does FSA or 4 kind of use programs do anything Activities are useful broadly speaking. Sports, work, um, any sort of extracurricular. There's a study that showed actually an increased rates of depression and risk for suicide in kids who didn't have employment over the summer. So keeping kids busy, keeping kids engaged with others, uh, giving kids something that they enjoy doing, all of that is good. Whether it's 4-H or anything else, I don't care what it is. If it's a positive group doing something positive and they're engaging with others in it, Right? It could be Minecraft, right? It could be anything. Um, you know, if they're doing something with others and engaging with it, and they're, and they're not just recipients of it, right? So when I say Minecraft, I'm talking about like programming, learning how to code, and things like that. Those are things that can be very helpful, uh, and there's some data to support that. Absolutely. Other questions? Yes. That's a great question. So you're seeing a psychiatrist yeah. or seeing meds, but they're not treating anything. Well, they're not doing the therapy. The medication's treatment, right. but yes. they're, not doing, they're not doing the psychotherapy. Right. Um, and the, the talk therapy or the psychotherapy, uh, who best to provide that? So I'm a psychologist. I have a PhD. I will tell you that there is no data to support that I am better than somebody with a master's degree. Um, what you need is somebody who is going to do what is an evidence-based practice, a practice that's been shown to be effective in treating adolescent depression. Um, you need that, but you also need someone who's just good, right? How do you know somebody who's good? You trusted others that say this person is, is good. Yeah, but it's not somebody you walk around going, hey, it's my not. neighbor, my, my daughter's It's not. Something, you know? So, so in, in lack, it's hard, right? <laughs> Um, and, you know, Yelp has tried to get into this. It's awful. I would not encourage you to go to any of those rating. All you get on those sites, anywhere where you look up somebody, all you get are the people who had bad experiences and occasionally the people who had good experiences. But almost always you get the people who are, just want to complain. Um, and I will tell you, I have seen people who are outstanding clinicians and they have two reviews on Yelp that are awful, right? Yeah. And um, I know at least one situation where that person that made their review never even saw that person, right? So you have to be very careful about those kind of social media um, uh, uh, rating systems out there. So unfortunately, we don't have anything to tell you how good. What I would recommend instead is that 
um, you pick the best available person that you can, whether that is... Um, I'm picking your picture while you're talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> whether that is somebody who is, um, you know, a, a referral from somebody else, a referral from a, uh, uh, someone trusted at school. Mm -hmm. Schools often have a good idea of who is good and not good in the community. Okay. Um, so that's where I would start. Um, I would also start with your pediatrician. See if your pediatrician or, or your, your internist has some recommendations. Uh, and then try somebody out. If you click with them, if, if the, the person you know, who you're working with clicks with them, uh, your, your son or daughter or whatever, great. Then look to see if there's change, right? If they are 10 weeks, 15 weeks into treatment, nothing has changed, then you should ask, what is going on, right? If they're like, well, treatment takes three years. No, treatment doesn't take three years. Treatment can take up to 35 weeks. We have seen that with really severe depression in adolescents. There's data to support that you need sometimes up to 35 weeks. So, you know, five sessions, probably not going to be enough for severe depression. Might be enough for a kid who's struggling with a breakup. But somebody who has severe depression is generally going to need something between 15 to 35 weeks of treatment, right? And so in that sense, and that's consistent treatment with the youth doing stuff, right? If you have a youth who's fighting it, who's not willing to really engage, it might even be longer. In the DBT you saw it was like six weeks of just pre-treatment. That's just getting them on board. So sometimes you need to do a lot of motivational work before you can get them to the point where they're ready to engage in the treatment. So I would say that um, you want to look for change. You want to look for some improvement. So connection is, is good. You need to have a good relationship. The, um, your, your kid needs to be able to trust that therapist. Um, and then number two, you need to be able to trust that therapist. Um, number three, you should start seeing some change, um, something different, either in what they're practicing at home, the skills that they're using, or ultimately, you know, down the road, some changes in symptoms as well. If you're 20, 30 weeks into it and you're not seeing any change, right, you need to be asking questions. And I would ask them a lot earlier than that, but that's the best thing I can recommend. And again, making sure that they're using, ask them, what kind of treatment do you use, right? If they say, well, I just kind of do my thing, right? What's your thing? What do you do, right? And if they say things like, well, we spend the first year kind of uncovering what it was like when they were one years old, no. They need to be dealing with the here and now, dealing with what's going on with them now. Um, they might be more psychodynamic. As long as they are interpersonal focused and as long as you're seeing um, changes, great, right? Um, and as long as they connect with them and you're seeing improvement, you know, as long as it's not inappropriate therapy, I don't care what they're doing if the kid gets better, right? So again, I'm a pragmatist in that way. Um, you know, if they're doing kind of a little bit wacky therapy, but it's working and the kid's getting better, great, right? So, you know, there are really great therapists out there that don't do some of these treatments and really have a big impact on kids. There are kids, or there are also therapists who do these treatments and really do a horrible job. So it's a mix, and unfortunately, we don't have a good way to tell you. So reputation is one of the best. Yeah. My Yeah. Over the next and it could be either, or it could be both. Yeah. So what, what, you know, I've, I've worked with kids I where, trust this yeah, at, what I would ask is what are you doing? Yeah. What are you working on? What are your goals? And what are the skills? So if, if, if there's just talk happening, but nothing being done differently at home by your daughter, then that I would question, right? So your daughter should be engaging in something differently in the way she thinks, in the way she interprets her body and her emotions inside of her body, and in the way she behaves. If you're not seeing those changes, at least trying those changes, then all that's happening is, is what I would call, well, my guess is that all that's happening is more of a support, a supportive psychotherapy. And a supportive psychotherapy doesn't generally result in change. It keeps people at a steady state, which is good if you have a chronic mental illness, like, like schizophrenia. Um, uh, but you want more than a steady state. You want improvement. So you should be seeing things, you should be seeing the effects of therapy, if not the actual improvements, you should be seeing differences in the way they're thinking, feeling, and behaving at home. And talking in terms of tools? 
it, it can be. If it's CBT, it's going to be more in terms of tools. If it's other things, it might not necessarily. They might not use that word, okay. right? Um, CBT tends to be skills and tools focused. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at more of a psychodynamic approach, it tends to be more of an interpersonal interaction. But again, there has to be something changing, right? Unless, and if it's not changing, Even if the symptoms aren't. Perhaps, exactly. So, maybe, Exa so I would have a conversation. Usually what I would do, that, yes, I would have a very, a very clear conversation with the therapist. Uh -huh. What are you working on? What's, what are you guys making progress on or not making progress on? Um, and if none of it makes any sense to you, then that's a, that's a warning sign, mm -hmm. right? If it's very convoluted psychobabble, uh -huh. that is a warning sign. If it's also like, well, we're just kind of chatting each week, right. that's also a warning sign. Well, what about, um, just Molly, oh. I'm taking pictures of <laughs> you. Nobody has to move. I, just have to I don't think I've been pictures. photographed this much yes. since I was a baby. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jason, by the way. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Okay. Scoot your loads. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, balance, go. Really quick, uh, wait. Do yes. You, do you know Kathy Grant, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, when you said Cabrini Green, I was one of the peer mentors. Who, my um, undergrad is in psychology. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I was, I went to, um, she was, with my. Uh, she had just joined the faculty when I was oh, in graduate school. Nice. Yeah, I, I know Kathy very well. Thank you. Small world. Right. <laughs> Molly, one question just kind of piggybacking on that. Do you prefer practices where there's a, um, what concerns me sometimes, I guess I'll back up a sec, is administration of a drug independent mm -hmm. of communication between the psychiatrist and the, and the um, therapist. therapist. Yeah. So do you prefer practices where there's like an integrated, non yeah, um, not necessarily. Um, I, I think there needs to be some communication in terms of just, you know, how is this patient doing symptom wise? Um, but it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily, I would not necessarily say that you have to have a practice that has a psychiatrist associated with it. Um, medication sometimes can be very straightforward. If it's very complex, then there needs to be communication between the therapist and the psychiatrist. So I always recommend, recommend communication between, number one, parents and the psychiatrist, school and the psychiatrist, those are the two primaries, and then also the therapist and the psychiatrist. Um, and mostly it's to indicate how the, how the therapist thinks the patient is doing so that the psychiatrist can adjust medications based on the symptom profile. Yeah, but as a therapist, do you really have a uh, one or two psychiatrists that are their go-to people for writing? Sometimes, for sometimes not. You know, the majority of people who write antidepressants are pediatricians. 70% of, right. of, the, of the antidepressants are prescribed by pediatricians. And if your practice, pediatric practice doesn't That's want to, then what? Well, then you have to go to a child and adolescent psychiatrist or an APN, an advanced practice nurse, you know, who has a psychiatric specialty. So, you know, it's, it's tough. We have a huge shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists in this, in this country, broadly speaking. Um, so it's, it's a really tough situation. Um, so, yes, yeah, so if your pediatrician says no, and they, you know, respect that because they're basically saying this is not within my wheelhouse. Um, that said, again, 70%, uh, maybe it's not that high. I might be thinking psychostimulants for ADHD. But it is very, very high um, uh, uh, of the antidepressants that are prescribed by non-psychiatrists. Um, in that situation, again, a psychologist or a therapist might be a consultant to the non-psychiatric um, uh, prescriber. Um, but generally speaking, you know, if you can get a psychiatrist that's part of the, part of the whole package, that's outstanding. That makes things a lot easier. But if you can't, a school you just, might, a school would be yeah. A great place to start School's with. always a good place to start. Sometimes they're out of resources as well. You know, typically you're going to wait three to six months for a psychiatrist. So keep that in mind. Okay. For a child and adolescent psychiatrist, that's going to be a typical wait period. So just to write a script. Just, just for the initial evaluation, okay. yes. Okay. That is not atypical. <laughs> so you often want to start with your pediatrician. That's the best place to start, and then if they don't feel you can, then you can, you can go to the next level. Um, one way around this, um, I'm still being mic'd, right? One way around this is, is an ER visit if you have to. Yeah. So if things get really bad, you go in for an ER visit, um, and then you'll get started on a medication right away. Take that out of the, <laughs> take that out of the YouTube, though. Yeah, please delete that. Yeah. Are we okay? That's a great question. To the parents. Yeah. So privacy and confidentiality as it relates to kids is highly complex. 
Uh, children in the state of Illinois have a right to privacy of their mental health records um, after the age of 12, 12 and up. So anything before that, it's, it's assumed that the parent can know whatever the child knows. After that, as a therapist, I can no longer freely communicate with you as a parent unless the child provides me with uh, a permission to do so. So if the child says, let's say I'm working with a 14-year-old, and that 14-year-old is actively engaged in substance use, sexual behavior, or other risky behavior, and that, that child says, no, don't tell my parents, I'm in a tough position. Uh -huh. If I feel that what they're doing is potentially going to, uh, thank you, potentially going to risk their safety, I can break confidentiality with the student or the, the, the child and talk to the, uh, the parent. But if I don't, I shouldn't, right? So there might be times, and in fact, in my consent form, when I have uh, parents sign the consent form, um, I, I used to have in there that it would say, there might be times I will not tell you things, including sexual behavior or drug abuse, bling, 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 like things like that, because it is not a risk to their safety, right? And because I don't want to break their both legal as well as therapeutic um, uh, right to confidentiality. Because uh, sometimes students, you know, or students, I keep saying students, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I just came from a school, so that's why. Um, sometimes kids might say to me, you know, I was at a party, I smoked a couple joints, blah, 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 right? I evaluate, there's no significant drug use going on. I'm not going to tell a parent about that. That's only going to cause a problem, right? And the kid's going to hate me after that, and there goes the whole relationship we just built up. Um, if, the, if, however, the kid's saying, yeah, you know, I'm using heroin with needles and we're sharing, whoa, okay, now we're in a completely different world, right? So I have to make that judgment. The therapist has to make that judgment. I will guarantee you parents don't like whatever judgment I make. Um, so I usually like to tell parents ahead of time, you're going to hate me around this issue. And then I just, I just take it. <laughs> But again, I have to, you know, I have, and, and the kids end up hating me as well sometimes when I do have to break confidence. So, you know, those are the judgments that we have to make as therapists. But in the state of Illinois, 12 and up. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions or concerns? Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.